Welcome, my name is Nicholas Pichotta. I'm the aerospace lead here at Applied Intuition, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Applied's new webinar series. During this series, we're gonna have senior leaders throughout both the government and industry engaged in thought-provoking conversations at the intersection of industry and national security with respect to autonomy. It's my pleasure today to welcome our first guest for this series, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Ragen Ralston, from, who's the autonomy prime lead at Afrox Prime. Uh, Brajan, it's a pleasure to have you here, a pleasure to see you again. I was hoping you might be able to give a quick intro on you, your background, and what you're doing over at Autonomy Prime. Sure. Uh, yeah, Brian Ralston, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Active Duty. I've been uh, actually for about 15 years now as a flight test engineer and acquisition officer, uh, spanning all sorts of different jobs. Uh, spent the last seven years really focusing on test and prototyping and experimentation of emerging technologies. So I'm really excited to be in AFWERX because that's the space we, we operate in, the emerging tech sector, partnering with small businesses uh, to accelerate dual use technologies. Currently as my role as the AFWERX uh, autonomy prime lead, as you mentioned, I focus on the entire autonomy portfolio in AFWERX prime and look at bringing in some of those emerging technologies uh, through our portfolio. Great, yeah, so as we both know, um, Frank Kendall's operational imperatives have been kind of the guiding light for how the Air Force is organizing their approach to new capabilities. And for those of our listeners who might not know what the operational imperatives are, the Secretary of the Air Force, Frank Kendall, outlined seven operational imperatives or capabilities that would be required for the Air Force to be competitive against a near peer adversary. So I think there are two really that stick out, um, two OIs that stick out, both moving target engagement and NGAD family of systems, hoping that we could walk through those two what the role of autonomy has within those two OIs, what the OIs really mean to the Air Force, and um, what elements of those capabilities are really important to, to develop. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Secretary Kendall really set his vision and his priorities through the OIs and kind of instilled a sense of urgency in the force to think differently, uh, how to think about how to bring new technologies, new ways of thinking, and, and able to respond to that pacing threat in China, right, and as we shift the focus from a counterinsurgency mission uh, focus to great power competition. The OIs are critical in that space. AFWERX is no different than the, the Air Force as a whole, and as we use those OIs as kind of as our guiding North Star, uh, making sure all of our activities and the big bets we take in prime are aligned to those OIs, and so that we can you know, have game-changing technologies and deliver those to the force. Um, specifically, you mentioned moving target engagement and NGAD. I'll just kind of step through those. The moving target engagement uh, OI specifically talks about, you know, there's going to be a large number of targets. We, we recognize that mass is a driving factor in the character of war. And we didn't think Clausewitz you know, mentioned that, right, way back in the 1800s. It's no different today. And as we looked at moving target engagement, we recognize that there'll be an overwhelming sense of targets we'll have to track. Um, so that's a perfect opportunity to bring in autonomy, right? So imagine hypothetically if we had a, a system of small UASs as a as distributed sensing node, right? Using autonomy on those small UASs to coordinate, you know, as a swarm technology and bring in those target data back. But that's still a ton amount of data for a human to process. So you need autonomy for that too, to fuse those sensors systems together and aid human decision making so we can maintain custody of the target to make sure we're um, prioritizing and prosecuting those targets if we have to, right? And it's all that autonomy leading into the human decision cycles. As we transition over to the NGAD family of systems, I think this is a perfect, pretty obvious use case of autonomy. Underneath that uh, family of systems is a collaborative combat aircraft I'm sure everyone's heard of, right? Uh, is a uncrewed uh, aircraft that's supposed to be partnered with a crewed uh, platform that is really gonna give us a new way to think about her dominance in a, in a, a new technological area, right? So <clears throat> clearly it's gonna to have to have autonomy built in. I think the key with that OI is that we need to have the ability to have a building block approach, right? We need to start small and we need to have the capability and infrastructure to iteratively develop tests, right? So we can increase our speed to the ramp of the technologies uh, so that we can induce early learning and fielding of those capabilities. Yeah, I mean, it, what an incredible, amazing time to be in the aerospace and defense industry. I mean, we had, um, not just with these OIs, but the work that AFRL has been doing, that the Air Force has been doing over the last four or five years, has really ramped up and changed the paradigm with the way that the Air Force is intending to compete on this national stage. 
Um, so with the with the role of autonomy in there in you know the OIs, hoping that we can talk a little bit more about who in the Air Force is helping to build out that capability. Yeah, so you mentioned most of the stakeholders already. Like AFRL is a huge uh, stakeholder there. The you know, the CCA programs and the program of record is looking at autonomy as well. You got folks like AFWorks, which is part of AFRL, right? Still looking at autonomy and bringing in some of those non traditionals. Uh, you have folks across the OSD and, and other services that are really focused on identifying the gaps and, and uh, continuing to ensure that we have a competitive advantage against our adversaries. It's been, I'm sure, quite a culture shift too. You had mentioned the, the switch out of COIN and then towards near-peer competition. I mean, it's, a, it's been a massive um, pull for the Pentagon shifting. Um, what has that been like in AFRL as we've retooled a greater, you know, aerospace and defense industry has been retooling, especially in the shadow of some of the ongoing conflicts? Yes, yeah, so I think the OIs are a great opportunity to really focus our efforts and drive us towards changing uh, kind of the way we think about uh, acquisitions and think about the way we fight. Right? So uh, it's been uh, really exciting, at least from my perspective, to have a new, fresh look about bringing new, uh, new solutions into old problem sets that we you know, have had over decades long, um, but using those OIs because kind of the driving fa factor that we have. Right? So with that, I guess, you know, and the OIs have only been out for a limited amount of time, but how are we doing as a, as a national defense base, you know, in the Air Force particularly? Have we met the challenge yet? Have we developed those capabilities? Is there still a long way to go? What's your, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I, I think you can't expect change overnight in a bureaucracy as, as large as the Department of Defense. It's, I think we all would love to just have a light switch so we can turn on and, and be like, okay, we're going to change today, right? And tomorrow we're gonna wake up and everything's gonna be different. Uh, it's just not the reality, right? And so I think you're, you're seeing a lot of steps in the right direction though. And we're, we're moving towards a way, we have a path forward. You know, it, it's gonna be an experimentation process. And you know, we talk about innovation, you need to set a, a vision, you gotta do short, uh, low risk experiments and get feedback loop and then, and then put, put that back into your solution, right? And it can press on. Uh, so I think the OIs are a perfect example of that. You know, we, we set that vision out uh, back in was 21. Secretary Kendall uh, put out those OIs and then we have uh, driven towards that. The staff has aligned and you have OI enabling teams and recognize that, hey, let's set up our, uh, our vision forward and, and take, take our orders and move out. It's been really cool to see over the last couple of years, the like parallel track that the Air Force has had and then the same AFRL and kind of the birth of AFWorks as a whole, and then into you know first Agility Prime and now Autonomy Prime, really in the full process of looking at how to de-risk new technology and get helping to get that into the department. So I was hoping you could pull the thread a little bit on Autonomy Prime specific mission set, now in the context of the OIs and then Greater Air Force. What is the role of Autonomy Prime? Yeah, so I'll step back actually and kind of talk about the broader role of AFWorks in, in enabling those OIs. So as AFWorks, we have three core mission areas. We have the, the Spark Division, the Ventures Division, and, and Prime. Those are core main mission areas. Spark really uh, focuses on using Airmen and Guardians and to spark ingenuity and uh, bring in those really grassroots uh, solutions to answer the operational problem sets. They also hold a, the Spark Collider events, which we had our first in-person one uh, just two weeks ago at oh, Fed yes. Supernova, right? Uh, focused around resilient basing, specific, a specific OI. And that was an opportunity to have government stakeholders, small businesses and entrepreneurs all in the same area going after a specific problem, really harnessing that American ingenuity that we have as an as a ecosystem. The Ventures Division you know, runs our Cyber Sitter portfolio, uh, also the Open Topic, the Specific Topic, and the Stratify TAC5 programs. That's an opportunity to have really is an open front door to industry to bring us their problem sets, or I'm sorry, the solutions into the government. Um, for those listening, check out our uh, website and social media for updates on those open topics, uh, specific topics and Stratify TAC5 programs as they're all uh, on the cusp of being released. So make sure you stay tuned to that. And we have the, the prime division, which I sit in. Uh, really focusing on harnessing emerging technologies and accelerating those through technical, financial, and regulatory risk reduction. Uh, so with, under Autonomy Prime, we recognize that autonomy was cross-cutting across multiple mission areas. 
and that there is a huge amount of industry investment and industry capability out there to answer some of our problem sets. Uh, so we took kind of the lessons learned from Agility Prime under the technical, regulatory, and financial risk reduction kind of construct um, and brought that into the autonomy, do a mission area that the Air Force cares about, which is you know autonomy. Yeah, very clearly. Very, very clearly. So under Autonomy Prime, several lines of effort uh, specifically focused under, um, you know, we recognize that testing autonomy is going to be a huge, huge endeavor uh, that's going to be bandwidth limited by the platforms we have or on the cusp of, of uh, having, right? Um, I mentioned at the beginning that really the key to having a CCA at, at the scales that we're talking about, you know, thousands of his order of a magnitude, I think Secretary mm -hmm. Campbell mentioned, uh, we're going to need the capability to iteratively uh, develop and experiment uh, with the tech that we're bringing on these platforms. Right now, we are going to be bandwidth limited. So we, we're working with the 96 uh, test wing down at Eglin Air Force Base and also the Air Force Chief AI and Data Office, the CDAO, uh, to stand up an autonomy proving ground that is going to be an opportunity to uh, test and bring in new technologies from the commercial sector. Iterate on those, getting operational feedback, and then spit those out into the to the um, pro major programs of record. We're also looking at uh, kind of that last mile logistic as we think about the Agile Combat Employment or ACE uh, mm -hmm. construct. Uh, looking at retrofitting uh, existing aircraft and heavy lift UASs for AMC for that last mile uh, logistics component. And then finally, we're looking at like enabling technologies. I think that's really where the dual use uh, commercial market comes in. Uh, very well. You know, we, we recognize, um, as I mentioned, that industry has a ton of experience uh, developing autonomy, iterating autonomy. Uh, you think of the automotive industry, you think of, uh, you know, you have small UAS out there to do other things, you know, uh, data transfer, rail systems, public transit, all those sorts of things all integrate in autonomy. And that's something that we can, you know, really harness and, and leverage and Autonomy Prime. So that's why we have the en enabling technology doing you know, the mission system kind of um, platform agnostic autonomy risk reduction. So, you know, I think over the last year or so, you guys have gone and done a, a lot of incredible things, both Agility Prime and Autonomy Prime, helping to break a lot of barriers and help to helping to advance this capability with the Air Force, which you know, still concurrently, we have waterfall software programs, right? So not only is it a paradigm in the shift from Secretary Kendall, the way that we think about war fighting, but it's also the way that we think about acquisition and the way that we think about, you know, integrating new programs and integrating new technology. So I guess, what are some of the, the two to three things that you guys are focusing on, both from both internally and externally? Um, as far as challenges that Autonomy Prime is looking to help facilitate the, the betterment towards, which are key enablers of autonomy. Yeah, so uh, some of those key enablers really, as you mentioned, the, the business models that I think we're gonna have to think of as we want you know, autonomy at scale, we're gonna have to start thinking about new business models. You know, Maybe the, the firm fixed price model, the cost plus models, those, those sorts of business models and contracting strategies may not work, right? And so. One of the things we're exploring is, is there other options out there um, through, you know, who knows, right? We're still in kind of the brainstorming uh, aspects of that, but uh, also looking at, you know, some of the things like, for instance, uh, how, how can we actually transition uh, phase two contracts to phase three contracts? Mm -hmm. Can we partner with PEOs to do early risk reduction? Um, as I mentioned, the, the phase three contracts that uh, are the, the cyber portfolio companies, AFWorks has brought in over the past four years, 4,600 contracts, wow. right? So uh, that is a large ecosystem that anyone, any PEO that has a technical problem can go and just sole source because they've already been competitively selected uh, a contract in, to a phase three production contract without having to do a JNA and arduous, you know, legal reviews for, for those sorts of things they can just say. Okay, Cyber, this company has a Cyber contract in the past. We have, uh, we are extending or completing the work that was done to that, and we can issue a phase three contract right away, right? So I think a perfect example of that is uh, actually, you know, you guys had an open topic that you were competitively selected for and then transitioned over to a phase three as an example, right? So those sorts of uh, transition strategies, I think is something that Autonomy Prime can really help educate the force 
And as we partner with PEOs and mature that relationship, we can help them answer their kind of technical problems and do early risk reduction for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to App Ventures for the work that they had done over the last couple of years to help bring the SIPR portfolio to a point where it can really be utilized in such an incredible manner um, that, that Autonomy Prime and Agility Prime have been able to, to kind of capitalize on. Um, if you don't mind mentioning how Autonomy Prime and Agility Prime and the Prime um, organization helps to leverage Stratify TACFI as well. And you had mentioned uh, integrating and talking with some of the PEOs and, you know, as those who have been in the industry there looking at that as an opportunity, as an open solicitation, you know, know that you have to have those end user customer memorandums. You have to have buy-in from both the requirement side as well as the PEO. So right. how has Autonomy Prime helped and will, you know, help to focus and leverage that capability as a value add to the PEOs? Yeah, so you're exactly right. Stratify and TACFI is a very powerful tool for the PEOs. Uh, and as they're interested in, in companies, they, they can provide matching funds, right? And then the Cyber portfolio comes in and provides uh, amplifying funds to that so we can really accelerate uh, and not have to, you know, really burden the, the PEOs as much who already have a strained budget. Mm -hmm. um, so we're able to leverage multiple pots of money to, um, you know, really accelerate the technologies there. Autonomy Prime is, is certainly working uh, in that Stratify, TACFI process uh, to, you know, accelerate promising technologies and working with the PEOs and the uh, end users and the requirements, you know, Magicom requirements offices um, to submit, you know, re requisitions for that. No, that, that makes sense. You know, I think uh, a lot of companies are building out um, new technology and, and there's the difference between Kendall's capabilities as well as you know, the acquisition of a new platform. Um, so how do we think about the difference between a, helping the Air Force achieve a capability versus acquiring a new platform? What yeah. are some of the contributing factors there? Right, so I think you'll notice like in the OIs that about half of them are not titled by a platform, right? We talk about moving target engagement, that's not a platform. We talk about space order battle, not a platform. Resilient basing, not a platform. It's, it's a capability, right? And so I think really Secretary Kendall was trying to get after this mindset and shift that we need to start thinking about capabilities mm -hmm. instead of platforms. Autonomy is a perfect example of that. Um, you know, when we started Autonomy Prime, we recognized that autonomy was going to be cross-cutting across platforms. I mentioned that earlier. That's not how we're currently aligned in the budget process. You know, we're aligned very platform and sector. You know, if it helps the F-22, the F-22 budget will, will pay for this capability, right? If it helps the F-35, the F-35 budget will pay for it. But what happens when a capability is cross-cutting across platforms? One of the things we need to do is to make sure that those capabilities don't fall off the bridge that we've built across the Valley of Death just because you know, they're, they don't fit nicely into a platform. We need to make sure we have a, cap a way to acquire that and fund you know, sustainment of those capabilities, right? So. And I guess that speaks more to the critical role that Autonomy Prime plays as a tech scout and advocate for a particular technology that can benefit the Air Force across the myriad of other platforms because of the way that the budget process works and, and such and such, so. Yeah, so AFWorks is kind of uniquely suited and, and situated to be kind of a, you know, we don't sit nicely under the acquisition um, authorities. We don't sit nicely under the lab authorities. We kind of sit in the middle, right? And so we are able to have that connective tissue between the PEOs and recognize their problem sets and sit with industry, right? We have a great relationship with industry, um, great, uh, you know, outreach uh, programs, we're all, all the big uh, tech events and conferences, you know, getting the message out there. We have great uh, outreach for our Cyber Center program. And then we also have that Spark network for operators too, and we have great uh, ability to leverage those. So we really sit kind of in the, the niche between all of those stakeholders. Mm. They're able to connect it, you know, as a tech scouting function. It will connect the technologies that are developing their Cyber sitter in the prime portfolio, connect those with the users to get operational feedback, and then you know, have them ready for the PEOs when they're ready to have validated requirements. Absolutely, so we're sitting here towards the end of September. Is there anything as we are about to you know, go over into a new fiscal year, a lot of new program starts, especially a lot related to autonomy. Um, is there anything that you're particularly excited to see, anything that the Air Force is working on in particular that FY24 is gonna be you know, really exciting to watch out for? 
Yeah, so we're, we'll release the, kind of the official start of Atomi Prime. We have a kind of soft start now working with our, you know, in, inside our Cyber portfolio and leveraging a lot of those contracts. We'll have an official launch towards the end of this year pending congressional approval as a, you know, budget approval. As we launch, you know, Atomi Prime, that's what I'm most excited about because that's, that's where I, I'm at, right? And so we'll have an ICO and innovative capabilities offering uh, released towards the end of the calendar year, beginning of next calendar year. Um, and that will be a great opportunity to bring in some uh, large all businesses of all sizes, right? Non-traditionals, traditionals, underneath those kind of areas of interest that we, we publish there. So be on the lookout for that. Sounds good. Well, Ridge, and thank you so much for the time today. It's been a pleasure seeing, seeing you again and talking with you. And thank you so much for the time. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. Um, great to, to have you here for this first of our series talking about aerospace. But stay tuned for further conversations at the intersection of both government and industry and all domain. Thank you.